um, whether it's your Google, whether it's your TikTok, whether it's your Netflix, they register with the FPB. Look at, just to crack one case, you need to analyze over 2,000 DVDs. First of all, think about just beyond the number, the kind of material that is there. Because when you give evidence in court, you must say what each a USB stick, what each, what was in the phone, what it was in the in the laptop, uh, what 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 you found. So it's it's a lot. Hello, welcome to ITF TV. Today in studio, we are joined by the CEO of the Film and Publication Board, Dr. Mashilo Buluka. He's here to chat to us more about the Film and Publication Board, what they've been up to, what the entity um, foresees in terms of the, the, the mandate um, moving from regulating film to more of the online space, um, and to hear more about where the business is going uh, in terms of the future. Dr. Mashilo, welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Mzee. We're grateful for the opportunity. It's good to have you in studio. Um, and for those that don't know, can you just tell us more about the FPB and you know what that what your mandate is? The FPB uh, is one of the oldest uh, public entities in South Africa, in the sense that it was founded in the 1960s um, to regulate um, uh, what or to classify movies in accordance with what they used to call the um, morality policies of, of the then government. Over the years, the organization went through a lot of transformation um, up until 1996 when it had to be aligned to the democratic dispensation. Uh, but it still continued to do that, uh, particularly with a special focus on um, the protection of children against what you call um, sexually abusive material. Now, the... In 2019, uh, a new act was passed on uh, by Parliament, was passed by Parliament. Now, that expanded the role of the film and publication from um, what it used to be as the classification authority to what we call an online content regulator. Now, what does that mean? It meant that the work that you've been doing has now increased threefold to look at the online space way in which one, um, we register the online social media platforms or what you call commercial, online commercial distributors for them to operate in South Africa. We are the ones that regulate them. We enforce uh, compliance with the act. We got what you call in terms of the act, um, the, the enforcement committee, which in case of uh, 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 non-compliance, we take matters there. Um, it's chaired by a retired judge. Uh, currently, it's judge, a retired judge, Masipa, who chairs over that. But the, the, the work that you've been doing, but the only, I think the act only came into operation last year on the 1st of March. Uh, this was more to give an, uh, the organization uh, more time to kind of restructure itself. We have been busy doing that quite a lot because there's no child's play. So since last year, we've been putting together some regulatory instruments that will enable us to do that. So we are quite happy with the progress that we have made uh, because from what we used to do to be what we do now, and I think I want to say that maybe as South Africans we may not, uh, 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 we may un underestimate that that we're actually amongst the best when coming to online content regulation. Actually, we are ahead of what you call uh, the uh, developed countries. If you consider that of the the the, the, the first or the, the highly developed countries, the likes of the UK only came with such an act this year in September. They only passed it on. They only passed it in September. So we are ahead of many. And we, I think we continue to share lessons, um, our challenges as the as the uh, online content regulator, and we are cooperating or collaborating with similar regulators elsewhere, like your Fiji, your uh, New Zealand, your um, um, uh, Ireland, uh, your Australia. Um, so there's a lot, there's a number that we're working with. But in essence, there are three uh, uh, focus areas the entity. One, we still protect the children. We still classify the movies. And now we still have to do a lot of work around online content regulation. So those are the biggest areas that we work with. So I, one of the things that I always say is that while in other countries, when they see acts of 
um, uh, sexual abuse material, they report it to the police. Here, even the police bring some materials to us, we analyze it, we appear in court. That's why in some of the cases you find that the FBI has been instrumental in terms of um, you know, presenting evidence in court and providing reports, assisting the law enforcement agencies, whether it's the police, whether it's the national uh, prosecuting authorities, in terms of making sure that you got pedophiles behind we uh, have behind bars. That's a it's a big mandate, but we we'll do we do whatever that we can. And just to understand what what does the online content regulation entail? What would someone who is within the organization need to do? Okay. The first step, like I said, is when they want to operate in South Africa, they must obtain what you call a distribution certificate or a license to operate in South Africa. In other words, they need to register with the FPB. Um, whether it's your Google, whether it's your TikTok, whether it's your Netflix, they register with the FPB. That's the first step. Then we give them a certificate to operate. And then through that, there are certain instruments that we uh, um, regulatory instruments that we, um, we 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 develop, they need to comply with those, and then on annual basis that um, or, or um, maybe after two years, that distribution certificate must be um, uh, uh, renewed. It's renewable after two years, but we are trying to change it to five years. We're still waiting for the finalization of the new um, procedures. And this is to give them more certainty because two years is such a short period of time. And then the second thing is they must comply with those regulations uh, that, that we passed on, that we pass or that we finalize and ensure that they comply. There's no two way about it. So um, that's what we do, So which is the second part. But but on regular basis, what we do is we issue what you call legal notices to say to them, how are you dealing with this? Tell us how are you dealing with this? And then if we see that there are gaps, then we engage with them uh, to uh, for, for, for improvement. Um, um, where we feel that there are gaps. But there are those, and what, what I want to say is that I think a large part or a large proportion of these players, they work well with us, they cooperate, um, uh, and I think that's, that's, that's a positive step. And Dr. Mochilo, we spoke about, you know, you, you mentioned um, moving, not necessarily moving, evolving from a film classification body to now online content regulation. How was that um, that evolution for the company? How did you guys, you know, can you take us through in terms of what it took to get to where you are right now? It, it was a very challenging task um, in the sense, more so I think what made it worse was the fact that we needed to do that without additional funding. Um, as you know, the fiscal system pressed, I think there are a lot of um, uh, pressing needs for the country, road shading, um, uh, social development uh, programs. Um, so there was no money. Um, so we needed to kind of generate our own money. And I think the Act allows us to do that, our own funding. So that's what we've been working on through this regulation fees. When they, when the operator slice, I mean, a request or register with us, there's applicable fee that they have to pay. And I think that has been able to help us. But it has been a very interesting, complex, and sometimes very strain, um, stressful journey in the sense that you got, just from a skill set point of view, remember, you got um, employees that are used to classification. Now there's a new mandate. So there has to be retraining, and that has to work okay, and it doesn't take easy. So we have to balance between bringing um, outside skills and training the internal one. We need, need to create that balance. And we have tried to do that. And one of the uh, the um, successful program that we run is what we call internal talent mobility. In other words, where in which people go on training when they come back, we say, where can we place you in the organization instead of um, uh, just um, uh, recruiting externally. I think that is what one does for us uh, because people and when they assume this new role, they get excited because new things that they have to do, new things that they have to learn. Um, but also, um, I think the collaboration with our international partners has been helpful in terms of helping us to get to speed with this expanded mandate. But the journey has been quite interesting, enjoyable, but you learn things every single day. Every day there's something that you learn. I think that has been the most uh, enjoyable part about it that 
Uh, I come from broadcasting and policy for a long period of time. That's what I've been doing. And that's what I studied. So I realized that I don't, I don't know anything. So I had to learn a lot of things. Um, but, but I think one of the interesting thing also out of this um, process, it, def it redefines what you call the future of work. In other words, the way that you should do classification, like just that migration again from classification to what you call content moderation, um, where in which you can use the same classifiers to moderate content. So it, 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 it added a new um, area of need for what used to call classifiers because throughout the world now, everyone is talking content moderation uh, so that you can protect the public. I think in terms of career pathing, um, it has had, helped a lot uh, when, when you got traditional classifiers who always looked at their work as classification. But now that skill, you can use it elsewhere um, in content moderation and quality assurance as well. Because in the past, um, classifiers used to classify and then that's it. But these days we do a, lo a lot of our work is more than classification because you have to use, especially as we use technology to classify like um, uh, what you call generative artificial intelligence or machine learning. So because a lot of your work is no longer in classification, a like machine is helping you to do that. What you need is a lot of quality assurance so that whatever the result of the machine gives you then can be quality assured. And a lot of work that is required in terms of the organizations in that area as well. Mm. You mentioned, you know, like emerging technologies like generative AI and ML. So what was the... Is so? Would it, is it fair? Is it a fair assumption for me to say that the FPB is using those technologies in the work that they doing as a content, as an online content regulator? Yeah, we use what you call um, an online content regulatory system, which is an automated, automated, automated system. But but because it's still new, we we do a hybrid. We do a hybrid. It's only I think by the end of the year we hope that it is seventy percent of the classification decisions that we issue will be machine issued. But at the moment, you do a hybrid uh, because the system is still new and you can't. You have to introduce the face approach, uh, not a big bang, because the risks are very, very high. What the are the risks? Risk. What are those risks? Well, remember, th there's one thing about um, machines and technology. They sometimes don't take certain cultural nuances. Um, I'll give you um, a very classic example, which is the same example that we give. Um, if you say nudity, for instance, in a movie, um, is prohibited content or is system, I'll give, use that as a it's sexually abusive material for the children, not supposed to be by children. But in African societies, that may not be the case. I mean, you go to KZ and where you see um, uh, young children not fully in clothes, it's normal. I mean, India is part of their culture. Let's say the residents, as an example, and then you put that in a in a in a in a, in a, in a machine and say, "Hey, give me a rating on this." I'm telling you to just tell you, "Hey, this is it's not uh, uh, supposed to be consumed by children." Meanwhile, it doesn't give you those cultural different um, uh, nuances. That's why then you need the human element to assist you um, to verify certain things. That's that's very important. Because classification, remember, is not um, a one-size-fits-all. That which you consider as harmful uh, in terms of maybe your nudity and pictures may be different in other jurisdictions. I think that that's what the, the human element gives you. And I know that um, we you, you spoke earlier about, um, you know, um, the evolution of the entity. So from where you, I wanted to find out in terms of how has the FPB positioned itself in with all these emerging takes. I, I know you've also spoken about, you know, upskilling and reskilling. Mm -hmm. What else is the entity doing in terms of, you know, positioning itself in an ever-changing technology environment? Well, the, you see, our vision is to be a leader um, in, in on online safety in particular. Because everything that we do is to you know, a create safer online spaces, whether for social, whether for economic, whether for uh, whatever reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what you want to do. And that's why I think one of the things that we do is we try, if you've seen recently, I think in August, 
we held what you call the regulators meeting, group, um, digital regulators meeting, where we brought some regulators because the environment that we work in um, uh, has collapsed all the boundaries, traditional boundaries, where in which you can't work alone as the FTB. Uh, so we need to work with all the regulators, whether the information regulator, whether the um, uh, the consumer commission. So we have to work together as regulators because you the, the environment is so intertwined and you need you need each other. That's why that's what we did. And secondly, even on the continent as well, um, we are working with the what you call on. And we are currently chairing it is called the the harmonization group, where we try um, to harmonize classification standards, especially on the continent, uh, because culturally, um, as Africans, I think we are very closer to each other. Um, therefore, that which considered as not palatable in African society, whether from Nigeria, from we're still the same in South Africa, so to a large extent. So what you try to do is to harmonize our classification standards in such a way that when a movie has been classified by a classification authority in Nigeria, then when it comes, it doesn't have to go through the same process. The same thing applies to a South African movie. So we try to work with the continent, but we work with, I mean, nationally, we work regionally, we try it also next year if everything goes well. Um, we want to bring on um, the regional regulators because this thing requires that you work nationally, collaborate nationally, you co collaborate regionally, you collaborate continentally, then you collaborate globally. Because the, I mean, the online uh, environment knows no borders, so you can't do it on your own. You need all this collaborator. And then on top of that, you need the, the law enforcement agencies, the, whether it's the, the police, whether it's the national pros the, the prosecuting authorities, and also the parents and the teachers, because that's your first line of defense, the parents and the teachers on a daily basis, because they are the ones that are teaching these kids. So it's important that your program starts there. Um, uh, that's, I think we work with everyone, NGO, civil society. But that's why one of the things that we want to do is to introduce uh, to do a program for the teachers. We are finalizing it and the one for the parents as well because to say parents, these are the things that you need to look for um, when you work with your kids. So essentially what I'm saying is that we want to see ourselves as this uh, leader um, on online regulation, but not doing it alone, but doing it collaboratively uh, with our social, our partners, whether it's the parents, whether it's the law enforcement agents, other regulators, both nationally, internationally, and and, and regionally as well. You spoke about, you know, online safety of children. I know it's, a, it's an important topic. Um, it's a crucial topic to discuss. So what I wanted to hear from with, from you within the South African context, um, what are what are the, some of the types of online, um, you know, child sexual exploitation, mm -hmm. online sexual exploitation of children that you're witnessing a lot happening here in South Africa? Yeah. One is um, grooming. It's a big one. That's why we got uh, this case recently. Uh, in other words, people um, uh, uh, grooming young kids. And then what they also do is they um, uh, they give them money. That's why that should that's what's at the heart of the case that we just dealt with um, for the Ackerman, Kharat Ackerman case, which he got um, uh, three life sentences. Um, and we're happy that um, EF assisted the law enforcement agencies in putting him behind. So that's the biggest area. That's why, and then the other one um, is what you call um, deep fakes. Uh, where in which I take people take the young kids, the young children's pictures, and put them on a pornographic movie. So that's why I always say to people, I know we love our kids. I know we love to share their achievements with the world, but don't put them on social media because the the the, the these pedophiles are looking for those pictures. You will find your kid on. Uh, movies that you never thought and then you'll be surprised because it looks so authentic 
that's the biggest area. That's why even on my social media platform, I always say to parents who, in excitement, they put the pictures of their children online. I say, don't do that. Don't do that because the, the dangers is huge out there. So those two areas are the ones that, that we normally see happen, especially relating to children. And with the grooming, so would they be using social media platforms or? They, they, they do. They, they, they do. But some, I think, is files that they keep to themselves and then they sell those files. Because you see, because it's a big industry, it's the underworld. What they do, they share this file. They, 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 they sell them and make money out of them. And you'll be surprised, how can someone buy a file of that nature? And they do. It's a big money spinner for them. There are people that are there to, you know, because they, 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 what they do, they, they try to recruit children for this. They ask children to kind of perform certain acts and then send them the videos. Once the children have done that, they give them money. But once the child does it once, now it's going to be blackmailed for the rest of their lives. And that's why there's, there's a problem. Like what they do is you just say to a child, do it once and then they do it. And then from then, oh, you don't do it. I'll release your pictures. So that's how I think poor children end up committing suicide. And, and there's a lot of suicides coming out of that. Because when you know that, oh, my pictures will be out for the world to see. Even my parents, what did my parents say? And then you have to do, you have to comply. And in terms of, I'm guessing also there needs to be some form of education then. Correct. So what is the role of the FPB within that, in, within, in, that, in that regard? 65% of the work that we do is around public education. We are trying to penetrate each and every region, uh, each and every home um, in South Africa. But because of um, limited resources, sometimes we don't do, but we do a lot of partnerships. Um, uh, we got um, a children protection team that visits schools um, on a regular basis. Um, but we also partner uh, with the likes of uh, public broadcasters. Um, I think one of one of the initiatives that we want to put in, um, um, I think in the next financial year is more on how can the distributors help us to do that. In other words, every at the end of every movie, there must be a message, whether the beginning or the end, there must be a message around the need for online safety. And we also run um, a public complaints program where in which as a member of the public, you can report any uh, thing that you're not happy with or that which you see online. And then we act on the basis of that. Most of the cases that we pursue sometimes are reported by uh, members of the public, like even if, including on classification, because you may have a movie See, things are so hard as this that you may not distinguish between an authentically classified movie and a non. Because sometimes even our own digital labeling gets pirated. You see a movie um, and then it has got a, a FPB label and you think, no, it has been classified only to find that it hasn't. So that's why I think that's what we do. But also how we do what you call raids. And I, th I think through raids, we do a lot of public education because you go to a text rank, we confiscate all those movies, then we say to them, see, this is not our label. Why is it not our label? Let me do that. Because there's a lot of work that we still have to do. Um, uh, because this industry, the, the perpetrators are not sleeping because they make a lot of money out of it. They will never sleep. So, yeah, um, we're still strengthening that, uh, building capacity um, into it. Um, I think the partnership with the uh, the SABC public broadcaster is always because it reaches everywhere. But the question is, and I think that's the difficult thing when you deal with the, this online space. Our children no longer watch traditional media like you and I. They are always on their gadgets, and that's where a lot of our public education should go. Otherwise, it would be like a, they say it in Nigeria, it would look like a, a, a man running after a rat coming from the flames. Instead of dealing with the flames, you are chasing the rat meanwhile the house is on fire. So I think more and more public education, particularly with the schools. Um, and then we also have, which is very important, the, the youth council, um, which allows us to, uh, I mean, to reach the youth 
the youngest member of that council is 13 years because we allow in they, they, they are able to have a conversation among themselves within their peer groups. Because if you say to me, I must go and talk to um, online safety and whatever to young kids, they are afraid to tell me. But if it's their peers, they feel more comfortable. So the Youth Council is doing an excellent work. Uh, these members are from different provinces. At least they are you know, able to reach the schools. They are able to, but there's still a lot of work to do because uh, they're about nine and that's not enough. We wish we could have um, groups in every province, but it requires resources to do that, yeah. The, the online environment is, 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 is quite vast and I can't imagine how that must be to try and, you know, regulate that and promote safety around it. What, what, how are you, how is the FPB partnering with other, you know, across borders? I think you might have touched on it mm-hmm. earlier, but just to get to a sense of protection of the public online. Mm-hmm. I think currently, like I mentioned, the harmonization group on the continent but internationally, we are a member of um, an international organization called INHO, which is an, an international network of um, uh, internet hotlines. The advantage of that, that represents over 52 hotlines across the world. Because in certain instances, some of what you see online, uh, are especially around uh, sexual abuse of material, we find this doesn't originate in South Africa, but it originates somewhere but it's in South Africa. We can't go there physically, so we'll then call. I think that's what the hotline assists us to do. Then you can call um, the hotline in that country and say, I've got this material. Where we refer uh, to these hotlines. Um, Japan, UK, Iceland, US, everywhere. Many, many parts of the world have got that. The unfortunate thing is that on the continent, you don't have that. It's only South Africa that has got that. And I think our effort in the last couple of months, in the last 18 months, I've been trying to get hotlines started on the continent as much as possible because, or as many as possible because, you see, the, the, the perpetrators go where there is less regulation, where there's no capacity. And you find that indeed that's where it's happening. So we're trying to establish as many as possible, but it's, it has been a challenge, but hopefully we'll succeed. So that's where we belong. So what, what we also do on that, you've got Interpol, which means they can deal with these matters across any border, which helps us a lot. Even if a country is a member of the hotline, but the inter- through Interpol, they can um, um, go into those parts of the world where uh, there's no hotline and assist us and, and do arrest everywhere. And in South Africa, there are some cases where you realize that uh, legally there are certain ways which you can manage. Then you hand the case over to Interpol because the uh, maybe your your legal framework is not enough, but then you are, it allows you to use the jurisdiction of another country then to deal with those matters. I think that's where the being a member of the hotline helps. But the other one is um, a new movement um, of online safety regulators um, called the Global Online Safety Regulators Network, um, which is quite new um, to deal with. I think it, it has got members in largely francophone, so not francophone, anglophone world. I'm a, yeah, anglophone world. Um, you're Australia, you're UK, you're Ireland, you're Fiji, and we are the only member on the continent um, who's on, and we are also a vice chair um, from 2024. Currently has been chaired by Australia, so next year we will be the vice chair together uh, with the UK um, uh, Ofcom. So I think through those collaborative, we want to bring as many people as possible to the the network because through that, I think you are able to face or to curb this thing called online harms because it knows no borders, knows no jurisdiction. Um, problems are the same. So we hope through this movement, I think we'll be able to, you know, to keep uh, or to maintain a safe online environment. Not that it will be easy, never be easy. Yeah, because one of the things that you have to do is to balance with freedom of expression, where in which you are not seen as a, you know, this army, men and boats fighting, you know, freedom of expression. Uh, you see, dealing with public issues or never is, especially like this one, where people say, hey, there's this problem. Uh, what are you doing about it? You try to do, hey, what about my freedom of expression? I mean, 
online hate is one of the biggest areas. Um, um, but sometimes when you deal with this, but no, 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 what about my freedom of expression? So I think it's, it's a very thin line between that, but we try to maintain that. Hence, in certain instances, we say, okay, let the member of the public make a complaint, then we act. Uh, you don't just start, go out and say, this hate speech. No, no, you have to wait for more public complaint. So there's that thin line to maintain. But I think that's how we're trying to deal with the online, this complex, ever-evolving, rapidly changing online space. Um, the most important thing is that you can't do it alone and you can't use traditional means to deal with it. It requires innovative, flexible thinking on a daily basis because every case is unique. And are there any, you know, um, examples that you can share with us in terms of where the FPB has come out successful in terms of a regulate, like an issue? Let's say there was an online hate uh, um, case and you guys came out. You know. Yeah. The, I think it was in July uh, in South Africa. There was what I think called Nation Shut Down, I think 20th of July. Um, I think some. Organizers were pushing for um, a national shutdown to say on that day you must shut down the country. Nothing wrong. That's not our space, right? But where it became our concern was when some members claiming to be belonging to certain movements or political parties came out and said, you want to tell the people of South Africa that no child, no person must be on the street on that day. We kill, we do this. Any child who comes because that is an incitement of violence. It's I think there was also elements of hate speech in that. And the video was going viral. Because that's, I think, as part of the on, online monitoring. We pick up videos that go viral that incite violence, they are hate speech, or they are harmful. Um, that one, first of all, was inciting violence. And it was a threat against children. Anything that threatens the livelihood of children the law says you must act with speed and act with speed. There it's very clear. So what we did then was one, we reported the matter with the police. Two, we, and I think that's where the the, the support of the platforms come in. Because the law says we can do that. We write to the platform owners to say, hey, pick this up, please take it down because of the following reasons. And and most of them take um, took it down. That's why you don't see that, that video anymore. But it doesn't mean that it will disappear. Sometimes it will come out. But at least I think the, the mere fact that you don't see it because it, it, once it's flecked, it becomes difficult to reshare. It, it will just block it, especially on platforms that are very strong on, on, on public safety. So that's why you don't see that video anymore. And then the other one was on, which is a big thing, um, and hence we are building a, a huge program around it. So on um, what you call uh, non-consensual sharing of intimate images. Uh, some call it revenge porn, but you don't want to use the word revenge pro porn because the reve the word revenge porn seems to suggest that there was some level of consent. Another one was a willing participant. Meanwhile, it's not the case. Where I mean, people share the images of other people without their consent. Um, negatively so. Um, so extortion, I think, is just one of those examples. We had a case in the free state, I don't know whether you remember it, where uh, the nude pictures of some individuals were shared by a boyfriend because the boyfriend uh, wanted money and the poor lady had no money and then that's when the pictures were shared. First of all, because of the gruesome nature of the pictures, uh, we said, no, no, this content can't be watched by children. So we request a takedown immediately. And then similarly, we follow the process of effecting takedown by writing letters to the um, to the um uh, to the platform owners. And they, they took it down. They took it down. And I think we are happy with that. The only step that we couldn't follow was the legal process. Uh, because that one you can only provide support once the victim says, No, I want to open a case. But if the victim says, No, no, I don't want to open a case. There's nothing that you can do because they don't want to open a case. And I think that's the most traumatic experience and that most of the victims who are largely women will tell you that, no, I don't want to relive this experience because 
the moment I take it to court, it means I have to go there and explain myself and all that. So it's almost similar to rape. So that's the challenge that we face. But on our part, we try to put together a support program for online victims. I think we are part of the a, a, a world movement called um, uh, Reclaim. It's based in, in Miami, where in which the good thing about that movement is that they, they or that group, they bring in victims who will share with you harrowing stories um, of what happened to them um, online. You've got someone, you've got a relationship, but when the relationship goes sour, the pictures get the release to the public to see and the impact that it has on you. So you can remove, this is the other part, you can remove the pictures, but the scars remain and that's why the support for us, for the victims, whether it's for the children or for the women and that's what we do. So annually I think we've got this event um, on online gender-based abuse in August. This year we had it in Pumalana. The theme for this year was sex tuition. Last year we focused on women in sport because we realize that women in sport face a lot of online harms, um, especially when, because of their their looks and whatever. Um, when they lose, everyone could be commenting about that. So we try to raise awareness on that. So it's, trust me, our scope is huge. And um, yeah, um, I think obviously the challenge around resource capacity uh, is, is a real one. Uh, if you look at what what um, they did in the UK after the enactment of the, the Online Safety Act. They had about 350 people. If we are a small, still trying to add capacity, we are a small organization, we are 95. And we still with the old mandate, likely on the old mandate around classification, what we do is we outsource that activity. In other words, we hire people on contract with classification. And then we only do the monitoring and the quality assurance part of it. But we are about 95. We are trying to add capacity as our resource um, uh, allow us. But yeah, that's the challenge that we have on a daily basis. But we have to do what we can. Uh, we can't sit back and say we don't have resources. Um, yeah. What would be the ideal number in terms of capacity to the entity? Look, the, the, the environment that we, we operate in require the biggest area of investment should be technology because technology should be able to do that. But there's one area where technology won't help you, the face-to-face -face public education. I'm telling you, even in this era of technological development, nothing beats that because people can interface, people can tell with their real life stories. Hence, I think in the next five years, we want to build a or strengthen public education program, both in terms of the programs that you offer and the numbers of the public that interface with the people. I think that's what that's what we we want to do. Um, uh, I wouldn't say this would be the perfect number, uh, but more than anything else, is something that will enable us to do what we want. If we can build technological capacity and incre increase more on public education, I'll be I'll be I'll be okay. Now on public and then. Because this is the other part. That's why if you come to the FPB, you'll be surprised that you got people that come from a police background. They are the ones that are conducting the raids on on because they know how policing work. And and but but also uh, the law allows us that we can have members of the police within our operations. Um we still um requesting the necessary departments through our own minister to assist us to deal with that part. So that when you got cases you don't have to go and get whatever that people say, no, no, you have acted unprocedurally, but you got the police that know how to do these things. But a lot of our work, you see, that's the challenge that you won't sit in the office and say, no, no, I'm doing this work in the office through technology. You still have to go outside. That's why if you go to every city, you'll find illegal DVDs, which someone must take them off the street. But we are not taking them for copyright. I think that's one thing that we must make clear. We are not taking them of the street for copyright violation. That's an added benefit um, for the content industry. For us, it's content that is not supposed to be in the streets because of its gruesome nature, whether it's gruesome, whether it's um, um, uh, pornography, a lot of them are that. 
And we analyzed that. I think maybe one day um, when you got time, I'll invite you to some of our offices in Cape Town. You go through, we don't just take and then destroy. We analyze to see what is in each. And we'd be surprised. Like outside, it's a nice game, such a nice game that every parent will buy for their kid because it's cheaper. But when you play it, just pure pornography. And I think most of the parents, when we start telling them that, oh, that's what I experienced. I bought a DVD on the street. I thought it was a, a TV game. And when I get there, the child tells me, what is in this one, mom? Imagine. Because for poor people, that's the only way they can make sure that their kids can access this material because uh, they are very expensive. Um, so, but how do we ensure that the material that they consume is right for the kids? I think that's the job. And for me, what will keep me sleeping at night is knowing that at least we are doing our work. We may not necessarily solve the problem, but it is that all the men and women of, of the FPB uh, I've got a very hard-working team. I mean, I said like 95. And But the amount of work that they do, the commitment, if you look at just to crack one case, you need to analyze over 2,000 DVDs. First of all, think about just beyond the number, the kind of material that is there. Because when you give evidence in court, you must say what each uh, USB stick, what each, what was in the phone, what it was in the in the laptop, uh, what, what what you found. So it's it's a lot. That's why we also got what you call the wellness program, just to make sure that after every case they can go and trust a bit and recover, because it's a lot. You and I, how many, uh, if if I have to say, watch this uh, the audio vi or visual or a video, you may watch it three minutes, I can't. The violence too much or whatever, that's too much. But here you, this person has to watch it until the end. And not only that, but there are others more so that you can present a tangible case. In, in my, so it's, it's, I, I, I'm, I'm happy to be leading that kind of a team. Young people, very committed to their work. Um, and I think very passionate about their work that at least we are happy that. It's, it's not much, but the mere fact that you can take one of the street um, at least same message. And then they, I think the courts have been helping us to with this lengthy jail sentences. They may not necessarily get rid of them, but at least we are trying. And the technology capacity, what would that look like for for the FPB? Well, what you need, first of all, is a um, number of ways. One, think about it. And, and uh, one, on, on classification, first of all, if you can have 100% classification, it means at least you are also minimizing the psychological impact on the classifiers. That's why for classifiers, we don't hire people on a long-term contract. It's two years, and then maybe we extend by another six months. Beyond that, we allow them to go and rest. Because imagine some of the moves, you see, the, I mean, the ones that we intend for children are not a problem. But some is violence. Uh, some is the all this uh, pornography that you see. They have to classify that. And then also the online monitoring team, because you got those two teams separate. So the online monitoring team on daily basis, they have to look the materials that are prohibited and then watch them provide evidence, gather evidence before they, they effect takedowns. So you can imagine at the end of the day, as a person, that's not good for you. Um, and also these people that have to analyze the um, the children protection team that has to analyze um, the material that are brought by, uh, whether it's the police or or any member of the public that you have to analyze um, to support the evidence in court. That's it's traumatic. Yeah, that's why FPB, you must come one day and take a stroll to see. It's a totally different building. There are certain buildings, certain rooms where not everyone can get in because of the nature of the material. But no matter how dirty the work can be, someone must do it. And I'm happy that I've got men and women who um, have volunteered to do this kind of work because they could have pro probably chosen to do something else. Ahead of 
before we had the conversation, we were talking about the rise of misinformation and disinformation, particularly around um, elections. Just to hear from from you in terms of what are you seeing um, happening and uh, how how the, if you can equate the the problem in terms of how bad it is. Yeah. What what we try to do, and that's what the act provides us with. The, it says, is it causing first of all, is it causing harm? Whatever that is said, is it inciting violence? Is it um, propagating for war? Or is it hate speech? For us, if it doesn't deal with this four element, we don't deal with it. If it's causing harm, yes, we deal with it. If it's not causing harm, no. I think that's how we, we look at it, um, misinformation, disinformation. That's how that's how I put it. That's why most of the time we try to shy away from um, defamation um, because it's a very, it has got its own laws. We focus only on those ones that relate to harmful and then we have to d determine what is harm and, and, and as the law allows. So that's how we approach them. At hands, we haven't said anything about it. But if it was, let's say, for instance, was talking about, um, what do you call it, about COVID, I was saying to people mustn't take, um, um, uh, what do you call it, injection or whatever, then you've got the role to play because it means that which he says is good, is harmful to the public. Um, it's harming the public. Or if he's talking about, you know, um, uh, yeah, hate, uh, that's when. Uh, but if it's, that's why for us, this the four areas when we look at, should we intervene? If we intervene, these are the areas. Is it feel falling within this? If it doesn't, then no. Mm -hmm. Hence, we haven't said anything about it. And you mentioned, um, you know, about, you know, how the, the, the money that some is made in terms around misinformation and disinformation, if you can just, you know, give us, talk us through yeah. what you've yeah. seen. Yeah. No, what what people think sometimes is that um, this information in particular um, is, especially during elections, driven by, by political uh, agendas or political imperatives. No, it's also a commercial imperative. There are people who don't belong to any party. They don't take part in election. But theirs, they know that this information drives advertising. And for therefore, it's a commercial opportunity for them. That's why one of the things that you're looking at now is websites that are spreading disinformation. And then we deal with those. But, but because they are carried on certain platforms, that's when we ask certain platforms to take them down. Um, it's not an easy task. But, but what you see normally, that's the, I think that's the trend. Yes, we have those that... I think as the political parties just for power to be elected next year, they'll be talking about all this kind. But for us, our approach, like I, I'm saying, still the same. Is that which being posted uh, propagating war, inciting violence? Is it harmful to the public or is it hate speech? If it's not, it's not our space. The electoral commission will deal with it because it's their space in terms of the electoral code. And that's why we have also entered into a partnership with them, um, the Electoral Commission, Independent Electoral Commission, on that space, I think, would be um, raising awareness on uh, uh, misinformation, disinformation, to ensure that these elections are not kind of um, delegitimized by, by acts of misinformation, disinformation. We'll be working with them. We'll be working also with the um, uh, ICASA, uh, the Independent Communications Authority of South Africa, which regulates broadcasting. Uh, but broadcasting, I think, because the weather code is easier. But our space, you don't have a code because you, do, you don't have a a, a group uh, representing all social media platforms. Unlike if you go to broadcasting or um, digital print um, or advertising, you know, you've got ARB there, you've got press media, cancel it. So they've got their codes. But this one, they don't have a code. Uh, so then it means you have to develop a code for them. And then one of the things that will be doing is to say to them, um, tell us what it is that you're going to do in the next day. Uh, I mean, uh, to ensure that we stop misinformation and disinformation on on elections. And notice that you're going to issue um, uh, this month. So is the a process then to help, you know, the platforms develop a code? Are you guys working 
we have to develop, we are, we are finalizing a code simply because, you see, unlike broadcasting sector, which is more organized, or the traditional print, which is more organized, or the advertising industry, which is more organized to deal with uh, conducts of their members and so forth. Social media platforms, the same way that um, it operates, say, you say, yeah, it's everyone for themselves. So it's very, very difficult. And they hardly, I'm yet to see here about the meeting of all social media platforms to talk their concerns. No, it's everyone for themselves. So, yeah, and, and very interestingly, even within the same stable, our biggest stable, you find that you've got, you got social media platforms that be, be, uh, belong to the same stable, but the way that they operate is totally different. Even their level of compliance is totally different. So I think that's the biggest challenge with social media platforms. They are not organized like other industries, like tel telecom operators. You know, they've got a union, they've got an, a forum, they've got where you can take, you can address them. And then they, you know, they develop a code. But this one, and you can see it's not only in South Africa, throughout the world, the regulator has been developing codes for them because they, <laughs> they, they don't have. So you would need to do codes for each one because they yeah. so we, we do we do industry code to say no these are the standards that you must keep anyone who doesn't comply with the standard it's non-compliant so will will issue fines the, the the in others i think i don't know um uh, the other jurisdictions i think and which is what i like uh, uk for instance if an uh, one of the platforms don't comply with their rules it's about 10% of their global turnover. That's huge. Now, with us, and I think it's a lesson for us South Africa, is that the minimum that we can impose around 150 rand. And 150 rand, what is that in, in dollars? Impose on for what now? For non-compliance. 150 yeah. rand. Yeah, and, but, but, and we are dealing with um, these guys that are denominating in, 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 in dollars. So that's nothing. That's why some of them will tell us, no, we don't mind. And... Um, you can impose fines. We pay the fines. It shouldn't pay you double. Because, yeah, the, so the, we are changing that. Um, I hope we're, we are trying to petition our shareholder, our policymaker, to change the law. I think the future we don't have prices in the, in the law. I remember, this was done in 2019. Probably in 2019, 150 was huge. The highest, the highest penalty that you can ever impose um as the it's, SPB. Yeah, it's 700. But Brands. Yeah, but that's 700. No, no, 700,000, sorry. Yeah. Oh, that was 150,000. Yeah. Oh, I thought it was 150,000. No, no, 150,000. Sorry, my apologies if I said that. So what you do is, but even 700, that, that one is extreme case relating to children, protect, children um, um, pornography. And then other 750,000. But you say 150,000. Even 700,000 is nothing for companies that make millions with lesser cost so that's why i love uh, the european model particularly the uk model that says no no for for offense but at least to a large extent i think i should say despite the the, the limitations that are in our laws to a large extent we've been getting good cooperation from um, the platform owners and some of them have been saying no, we want to work with you Easy. they do in addition to that which you provide or prescribe and you said you're trying to, you know, um, convince the, your shareholder to try and up that. Yeah, or amend the law. Amend because you can only... So that there isn't a specific... Yeah, fact. yeah. You allow the, the regulator to impose fines as per the, 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 the nature of the case. Okay. Look at the case and say what would be the, the perfect sentence. And then if they are not happy with the sentence, then they can appeal normally. Yes. But, but I mean, to put it no... no um, Currencies fluctuate. I mean, what is the the rent to the dollar today? And then it's one hundred and fifty. Yeah, uh, it's nothing. Doesn't mm. actually. It's not a deterrent at all. Not that if you got um, a huge fine, then it's going to be a deterrent. No, but because some of them, like I said, they, they are willing to cooperate and work with us because first and foremost, they are uh, parents. They want to ensure that. Or they are sisters, they are brothers. You don't surely want to see your sister, your brother being um, harmed online, because being online is no longer a, it's no longer a um, a social issue. In certain senses, 
your 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 environment you like we are in the digital space but imagine when you if you are harmed you even scared to go there and how are you going to make ends meet as well as the problem and i wanted to like what's usually the turnaround time for the platforms to take down something that is considered you know no one is saying immediately and they do the moment they receive the letter they do so it's a written it's letter or, you know. Yeah, I mean, no, no, it's a, it's a formal letter. Oh, it has to be a formal yeah. letter. Yeah, it has to be a formal letter, unfortunately. But where we got a challenge is those that are, um, they don't have offices in South Africa and becomes a problem. Who are those? Um, Twitter, we don't have. So we have to write to the office in the US. And that will take for you. <laughs> yeah, but, but for some very interesting reason, I think on the last case... The last two cases, they have been very cooperative. But I think one issue that we are dealing with is the what they call the black Twitter, which is a problem. I mean, it's a, when you talk about a platform that is so, I don't know what to call it. Yeah, it's that one. And How so? A lot of anger, a lot of issues that are there. I think I... Yeah, if you want to see hate, if you want to see all these negative things, you go to certain platforms, including that one. Uh, but but we still have to. And I think one of the challenges that we have is coming up with a technology that will be able to pick up these things in local languages. Because the hate, incitement of violence, and I think the 20, the July riots of, 20, was it 2021, 20, 2021, showed us that that you can use your language. I mean, these guys, I mean, these technologies are developed elsewhere. So what then happens is that they can pick up things quite easily in English, but they may not pick up saying in language, particularly if the language is not formal. And you know, in many parts of the world, we are not using formal language. We use Persian language that develops out of, I mean, like in South Africa, we've got our own Tutsi dialect. You go to Pretoria, they've got their own lingo. And so everywhere, I mean, Nigeria, everywhere you've got this different kind of language. So sometimes the technology doesn't pick that up. So we need to have our own technology. Yes, to pick those things up. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. That's why I think having diverse teams uh, when on, on content, on, on, on online content moderation helps. Because the person else, no, I know where this is coming from, this thing, this is what it means, the nuances that goes with it. Because you see, language is such a complex, dealing with language is such a complex thing. It's quite interesting. Yeah, no, no, it's a, look, like I'm saying, it's not an easy mandate, um, but unfortunately we have to do it. And on behalf of the public. What would be your ideal budget for the FPB to be able to for now, let me be honest with you. If if I could get, it's an example, but maybe for for fifty per annum will do a lot as an organization. Just four fifty, not not much per annum, will will do a lot. Technology, public education, um, online monitoring will do a lot. Because I think that's where we need more resources. Hence, I said, you see, FPB, the challenge is that we don't just deal with technology. We have to have men and women with boots on the street for compliance. Remember, one of the areas that we do um, is in, what do you call it? I mean, the adult shops. Okay. Never an easy task. Have you ever been in an adult shop? No. Yeah, because of the FPB work that I work go well, that you have to go there and experience go see whether this guy's complying. So what would they need to comply with? Yeah, in other words, that's why I think because of the FP the FP Act requires that first of all adult shop should be covered, black windows. Okay. Nothing should be outside. Images should be outside. Then when you get in there there must be a certificate and no children should be allowed in there. So you have to get in and do for compliance. So you need to have a big heart to have that. <laughs> because there are clients in there, right? 
uh, when even when you are there, they are going about their business. I think that's the most difficult thing about our work. Like it's the work that yeah, only the brave can do. So you have to get in there yeah, and check whether they comply. The material that they sell, have they been classified? Because you have to classify it. Whether they are selling DVDs, must check whether it has been classified, correctly classified. So, um, in other words, where a situation where all the material, that's why I said, four feet per annum, I think, will help us a lot. Where in which, when a member of the compliance team gets into an adult store, he can check all the um, uh, the DVDs, the titles that are there, punch into the FPB system, and see whether indeed we have classified them. Not because they are carrying our logo, because the logo they have been uh, pirated. So go through that and see whether uh, is, it appears on our system and check the license, whether the license is authentic. So so it's being able, first is take build technology, but also making sure that, because someone must do that, uh, you can't say hey, remotely I can use a, a drone to go and ensure compliance. No. Uh, uh, um, um, uh, it can help you to I mean, kind of check the environment, uh, scan the environment, but someone must go and do it. But also I think the the work that we do around training the police so that they can understand this environment. I mean, if you go to the police now and say, hey, sex torsion, uh, or NCII, uh, some, not many stations will understand that. But you must educate them so that when everyone comes and report the case, they know what they're dealing with. So what, how would, is it like the, so the educ who's then who's with the police, for example, law enforcement? Who's supposed to do that? Whose role is, supposed, is, is it to try and drive that they are aware of that these are some of the cases that uh, the public might bring to them and they need to be yes when this. when when a person comes to report a case they know where which category does it belong uh, one of those that we had was they, they I think they said they reported it as um, in certain as rape for instance when it goes to court they say but was there any you know, the definition of rape then you find that it doesn't comply with rape then the case gets thrown out Meanwhile, the case, if it was classified differently. So it's just that part of educating the police on that. So that because they're the first line of law enforcement, um, they know what they're dealing with. And then even when they go to court, they know what kind of evidence they need to bring. So that the case is not thrown out. So I think that's that's the the work that we are continuing doing. Because everything, things are changing. Laws are changing. So it requires that you, on a daily basis, you look what you do. And just to maybe, like, as we wrap up our conversation, what would you say, what does the future look like for the FPB? Where are you there? Where, where do you see it in five years? We, I think for me is, one, to increase our self generated revenues through um, all these regulations, regula regulation fees, so that I think we can do all the things that we want to do. That's number one. Two, build capacity. Through that money, then build capacity. Um, and then more collaborate, collaborate, and more collaboration um, across the spectrum, whether it's with parents, whether it's with teachers, the law enforcement agencies, the regulators, both regional and 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 uh, continental. At the moment, regional, that's why we're having a problem in the sense that even though there is this um, um, movement and popularity on online safety, even at UN, but regionally, there's nothing. We are not discussing it at all. And, and, and on a regular basis, I get calls or correspondence from the colleagues in the region who are not within the regulators or proper, I mean, establishing as they say, hey, in my country, the issue of online safety doesn't exist at all. Yeah, so how do we ensure that we get the conversation going in the region? Because that would be the first step in making sure that the rest of the continent picks that up. 
But at currently in the region, people are still doing, and most of the regulators are still doing traditional regulations. But meanwhile, we are facing the biggest space, which uh, is in our living room, is in our workplace. So, because first of all, we are human beings. As a human being, you are a member of a family, you are a sister, you are a brother, you are a parent. Right? And, and this problem that we have is within our living room. That's why now there's high suicidal cases um, amongst the youth because of online harms. And and that's why in other countries they say, no, no, my child was asleep and then social media came and take away life. So how do we ensure that we have this going? For me, if we can achieve that, I'll be happy. So like I said, I think raising revenue to be able to do that, build capacity with the entity, but collaborate and collaborate. And, and finally, um, you know, public education is critical um, so that whether a parent, whether a child, whether a law enforcement agency, we're at least on the same page regarding online safety because it's all of us task. It's all of us task. It can be the task of FPB. All of us have to do that. Thank you, Dr. Rishi. For more videos from, uh, from ITWeb TV, please subscribe to our YouTube channel.